I think you you know the basic story that it was no. November 1st of 1911 that a, what was called an explosion at a powder manufacturing plant killed eight young women in the plant just outside, on the Cold Peak Road, it was outside of uh, Chehalis. We've kind of come to talk of them as the girls. Well, two of them were. Two of those girls were only 14 years old. They were working in a powder manufacturing plant. There were a lot of powder manufacturing plants, I think, going up to about that time because most of the, the timber had been cut and the timber companies were moving on to where the timber was and they didn't bother replanting because uh, the timber resource was in, inexhaustible. It would always be there. Kind of the way we talk about uh, oil and natural gas today. So instead of replanting, reforesting, they sold the land to farmers. And what they sold was land that had an awful lot of stumps in it. And the best, easiest way to get rid of the stumps was to blast them out. So uh, a numerous powder manufacturing plants were kind of hastily organized and perhaps, perhaps too hastily. Uh, the accident has been called an explosion, but in reality, judging from the, uh, the chemical analysis of what they were doing, it is more likely it was a flash fire, which was just as deadly as an explosion. In fact, perhaps even more so, because the flash fire would have instantly uh, destroyed any oxygen in the, in the area. Those girls never had a chance. They couldn't have ever taken a breath. Most of them, in fact, as far as I know, I think seven of them were, all, were trapped behind uh, a large workbench and, and couldn't have gotten out. The identification was almost impossible. They were so badly destroyed. Three of them were identified. One was identified by her uncle. One was identified because of a missing tooth. Another one was identified because of a half-melted ring still on her finger. And the others, impossible to identify. That's, that's how vast and how quickly this, this incident happened. Well, the three girls who were identified were, I think, uh, buried in their separate graves that were marked, and John can tell you a little more about that. The other five were buried together uh, it not well. They were buried in separate caskets, but buried together in a uh, in a single large grave. Uh, I think it will be inter interesting, John, if you'll tell how that uh, grave was eventually covered over by shifting dirt and how how it was un discovered and, and uncovered again. Well, th this became a, a a national event. It was uh, in newspapers all over the entire country, probably because only a few months earlier than that, in March, the, the shirtwaist fire occurred in New York City. So people were aware of working conditions. And this one is, I think, particularly valuable from the union standpoint, from a labor standpoint, because it demonstrated the fact that even though labor laws were enforced, uh, child labor laws were, in, were, were, excuse me, they were passed. They were not enforced. They were being totally ignored. And this, I think, was one of the last straws that, that uh, created a, a, a feeling in our country, all, all over the country, that this could not go on. I think it's a, it's a good point for it was a good starting point for labor's activities. We all know that you know, labor was in extreme trouble back then. You know, the, the Wobblies were, were fighting for the, the, the right to only work a 10-hour day, six days a week. They were right, fighting for the right to be paid on money instead of script which could only be redeemed at the company store. And this was the condition of workers. Fourteen-year-old girls were working because 
undoubtedly the family desperately needed the money and they were hired because they undoubtedly worked awfully cheap. Well, uh, I think that's essentially what it, what it means to, to labor today. It, it's, it, it created an atmosphere that never, never went away after this, uh, of where labor finally had a foothold in, 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 our, uh, in our national thinking. So what we're doing, Gordon Adland, uh, in, a, in a column a couple of months ago, brought this, this out. He said, these, these ladies, these girls, should be memorialized. And uh, it caught the fancy of several of us, and we said, well, let's, let's try to do something about that. And uh, that's, that's why we're here today. We're, we're raising money for uh, a memorial of, as, well, as much as we can afford. Now, let's put it that way. Uh, the, uh, the price of marble is, is almost exorbitant. Well, it is exorbitant. Most of it, most of it has to be shipped from China right now. John can t t talk about that. That's, that is shaping some of our thinking uh, at this time. We'll, uh, we're trying to get whatever we can afford to memorialize uh, these girls, and hopefully we can do it maybe on the November 11th of this year. John, why don't you take it over now? And, and talk about uh, what you discovered working with Daniel LaPlante about uh, the available memorials. 